we've been um, here for a long time and we're behind schedule, but I just want to let you know that we have a CEO um, from the hospital, uh, Dr. Sickles. And so let's give him a round of applause. He's going to say, say hi to us. He has to leave, but he's been here the whole entire program. Good morning. And, and I, I'm saying hello and leaving at the same time. I apologize for that, but we got behind schedule. One of my colleagues is going to represent St. Michael's. And I think what I would uh, the point that I would have made if I had a chance to speak on the panel today is that we spent the first part of today talking about maternal health, and I just want to make the uh, important point that maternal health begins long before a woman gets pregnant, right? And it's not just maternal health, it's paternal health also. We have to keep our families healthy, we have to provide good primary care, we have to really find a way to reach out into the community because we're all dealing with, in, with inequity in healthcare. And we have to make sure that when a patient comes into the hospital or comes into the office, that we're doing more than just writing a prescription. We have to educate them and support them in the best way possible. So having said that, I'm gonna go back to work because I'm kind of being called back to the hospital and I apologize to you all, but this is a wonderful program and thank you. We're going to call Director Alsbrook up and her panel. Could we just uh, get on stage and we're just going to welcome the hospitals as they talk about some of the policies around this. Please get a cup of coffee. Uh, moms, get a massage that's available to you. If you're a mom, you can get a massage. The lactation room is in 208. Um, and we have a whole bunch of resources downstairs, but we're gonna ask you to kind of stick around so we can hear the commitments from the hospitals. Thank you so much. And we're gonna start right now. Uh, good morning, everyone, or almost afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ketlin Baptiste Salzbrook. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the Director of Public Health for the City of Newark, and I will be your moderator today. Um, I'm going to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, and we're going to dive right into some discussion about maternal health and wellness. Look, I'd like to start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Lois Green, and I realize that we the only thing that separates you before your massage and the food, so we're going to be brief, but I am the Senior Vice President for Wellness, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Human Experience, and Population Health at University Hospital in Newark, and I'm pleased to be here. Yeah. Clap it up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Moses Salami. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing at St. Michael's Medical Center, right around the corner. Certainly happy to be here and to be uh, with uh, the moderator and our distinguished uh, guests. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So again, first let me thank our esteemed hospital leadership uh, for accepting the invitation to today's Cradle Project Conference being held by Mayor Baraka's Office of Comprehensive Community Education and for joining me in an important discussion about maternal health in the greater Newark area. As you know, today's conference builds on the mayor's 10-point literacy plan that was released in July of this year in response to alarming data that speaks to nationwide learning loss due to COVID that has impacted literacy rates amongst elementary age students. The dilemma is troubling, especially here in Newark where only 19% of third graders passed the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment Literacy Exam. The brilliance of the mayor's plan is the connection it makes to addressing the quality of care individuals receive before, during, and after pregnancy. The opportunity it gives us to introduce reading early to our babies as a way of bonding and fostering intellectual growth, but also addressing the disparate maternal health outcomes, particularly amongst black women. Today's discussion is titled, Unpacking the Legacy of Health Inequities, and we also want to talk about solutions and strategies that work and steps that your hospitals have taken to tackle this problem. Uh, there are a series of workshops scheduled throughout the day that will touch upon a spectrum of topics that impact prenatal health and wellness. So my first question to you is, what are you looking to learn from this conference or what have you already learned from this conference? Dr. Green, do you want to start? Sure. So I think one of the things that I really was blessed as I heard all of the speakers is that there is an increasing awareness 
of what has been going on. It's sort of been a silent, you know, women have been dying. We have some birth outcomes that are worse than some third world countries. And I think the increased awareness allows us to do better and to really work together to solve the issue. So that's been important. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, when you think about what the mayor spoke about, each of us have to play our role in really addressing a lot of the literacy gaps, maternal health disparities. Us as the hospital, we have a role to play. So I think it's really important what I've learned and taken away that we all are like a cog in the wheel. We gotta play our part in how we can address that, whether that's through our community outreach, whether that's participating in literacy programs, supporting our community organization. Those are some of the key things that we can continue doing. And you know one thing I think was really powerful you know, there's a, a phrase that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Yeah. And so we mothers have a huge impact on what happens in the world. And so it, it, I think women recognizing how valuable you are and how what we do makes a difference in outcomes has been really, really impactful. Absolutely. No offense, men. We do rule the world. Yeah, sorry, men. <laughs> uh, so my next question is, how has your institution committed to addressing this issue? We know that black women in New Jersey are for my, for, far more likely to experience birth-related complications than white women. And more than half of these complications occur after birth. Um, so how are your institutions committed to addressing this issue? So we don't have enough time to talk about all the things that University Hospital is doing, but I will say that looking at best practices, you know, there's researchers that are here, and there's so much good information, but making sure that we adopt protocols that impact maternal hypertension, that impact maternal hemorrhage, so that we as an organization are doing the absolute best outcomes, the best things that we need to be doing in order to make sure that women have, have good outcomes, like making sure that when you go to the emergency room, you let them know that you've had a baby in the last year. Mm -hmm. Something simple like that. For, you know, four months after you have a baby, you're not thinking about it. Yeah, but yeah. if you come in with hypertension or some kind of bleeding, this could be tied to the birth, and that communication needs to be asked and needs to be communicated. So outcomes and making sure that we're um, doing and installing best protocols. We're also making sure that we do whatever there are as far as best practices around population health. So University Hospital has an entire population health division that is focused on what are the best outcomes when it comes to, print, when it comes to um, maternal ch child. So we have centering classes. We have centering parenting classes. I loved one of the speakers that mentioned it's important for us not only to educate our moms, but to educate our fathers, right? So we have um, a fathering program that, that's um, been in place. Uh, we also, I'm going to let you know, oh. <laughs> have a program oh, called Familiar yes. Faces. Any community health workers in the room? The work of the relationships that you build with your community health worker helps our moms have better outcomes. The research is already out there. Any um, making sure that moms understand the importance of going to your visits. The worst thing in the world is to have a mom come and say, I'm 34 weeks pregnant or I'm 35 weeks pregnant and this is my first time showing up. There are things that we can manage early. You know, we might have what they call gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes. If you have that, you're only gonna pick it up in that, when you, there you go, people know. But if you pick it up early, we can manage those blood sugars so you don't have a baby that has a higher risk of dying in childbirth. Those visits are so important. We prioritize everybody else. Make sure you prioritize yourself. This is a communication. You need to get to those early appointments. We want to see moms in the first trimester. Like I told you, I could take the whole time. But I <laughs> no, but she, she, sp she spoke on it all. And I think at St. Michael's, our core focus really is on the women's health. You know, there is an important linkage between primary care care, maternal uh, during that time period, and making sure the moms are, you know, healthy postpartum as well. So for us, just like you said, in the emergency room, our ER doctors are very careful to make sure, asking that important question, have you had a baby within the last year? That's very, very important. And also, although we do not have maternity services at St. Michael's Medical Center, making sure all of our expecting mothers have some of the collateral of, of information of where to go, yeah. you know, because although we don't have OBGYN here, you know, there are a lot of resources within Newark as well. And then another linkage that is very important to us is our Women's Health Center, where we specifically focus on gynecology and gynecological health, you know, from your pap smears, um, as well as our breast health center. So we focus on, you know, all things that concerns the women, right? And 
try to fill in that gap of maternity by working with our community organizations. That's really where we uh, see our strength. And, and just partnering. There's a community needs assessment that most of the organizations have done. You can go on the website. We've assessed and looked at what are the major issues and then prioritize prioritized a community health improvement plan mm -hmm. that addresses what are the things that we need to be working on and access is, is probably at the top of that list. That's awesome, that's awesome. So how can we ensure that your institution's healthcare workers are acknowledging this issue and fixing it? I'm sure you all have engaged in discussions about eliminating unconscious bias mm -hmm. um, in the healthcare system that contributes to health inequity and disparities in the quality of care received during pregnancy. Absolutely. So implicit bias training is something that's required of everybody. I don't care whether you work in the business office yep. or you're a clinical person. And I give one example when I tell people, like, why do I have to learn this? Because if you don't know who you're taking care of, a mistake can happen. Yep. So if we are all, most of us are English speaking, however, if you don't understand that that you are taking care of a population where there are language differences. I'll give you one example. Um, we have a, a well-meaning, it wasn't in our institution, it wasn't anybody in Newark, but the well-meaning nurse wrote out for this patient that she needs to take her medication once a day. O N C E. And she was very diligent because she wanted, she had a good-hearted intent in making sure that patient understands that you just only take it once a day. However, in Newark, we know we have a high Spanish-speaking population. What is O-N-C-E in Spanish? 11. So the miscommunication could be take 11 of those pills. And, that, and if you don't realize that we need to give individuals information, health information in a language that they understand, a very unintended consequence can happen. And that's just one example. So, Understanding who you're taking care of and how implicit bias impacts everyone is an important education that we're putting um, folks through, as well as SDOH training, right? So what is SDOH? The social determinants of health. They are 80% more impactful on outcomes in a women's pregnancy than the medical care. We all give mm -hmm. excellent medical care, yeah. but the, the economics, the housing, the food insecurity, all of those things are gonna impact, and hospitals never collected that information before. So we've spent a lot of time putting in our electronic medical record an assessment of social determinants of health. Right. so that we have the data to be able to do the outcomes. Right, right. And, and just to add on, one part is social determinants of health, the education of that, and the other part is having a diverse workforce. You know, how can we take care of the community if we don't look like our community? Or understand, um, you know, the language they may be speaking. So that's, those are some of the ways we've been able to really fight that implicit bias from the training, from the education, but also making sure that we are able to get over those language barrier humps. You know, understanding the nuances in different religions, in different communities, um, which is very, very important. Thank you. You guys touched upon cultural competency mm -hmm. um, and also social determinants mm -hmm. of health. How do we use the information that we gather through these screenings yeah. to actually address the problem? Mm -hmm. You know, we are a federally qualified health center at mm -hmm. the city of Newark. And so uh, although we are not hospitals, we, we, we are focused yeah. on achieving the same objectives right. ultimately, ultimately, which is the health of, our, of the population that we serve. And so how do your hospitals and your organizations take the data that you're collecting from these screenings to in, in implement change and, and strategies to address those problems? Yeah, some of the ways we take some of the data is, one, we take the data, we'll look at it. Okay, what are some of the disease areas that we can really attend to? You know, how can we fold that in with our community outreach plan? You know, how can we take our mobile unit from outside of the hospital into the communities? Okay, maybe we need to do screenings, all right? Maybe we introduce our In the Ping Early Cancer Detection Program or our Peter Ho Memorial Center. It's really taking that data, seeing what areas that you can really plug in, what community organizations can you really work with. Those are some of the best ways that we go from beyond the hospital to get into the community and really, uh, you know, address some of these uh, disparities that we are seeing. And, and I would only add that we need to listen to our patients. Empower our patients to communicate with us and let us know what they need. So if we're listening, it's about building trust and making sure that we hear you. Right. You know, we were hearing that, oh, people don't understand in the hospital what the doulas do. So we impact, you know, initiated an entire education on what exactly is a doula. They are not a visitor. They're a part of our healthcare team. What, you know, so that, everyone understands. So it's really a conversation in building trust with the person that's taking care of your health. But it's also important that you prioritize your health. Right. 
quick story. I had a patient that came into the emergency room and he was about 30. Maybe she was about 30 something years old. And she said, how long is the doctor gonna take? And I'm like, what's the problem? She's like, my leg is hurt. And I'm like, what happened to your leg? Well, when I was 16, I hurt it and I think I should get it checked out now. If we don't care about our health, you can't go to someone else and say, care more about me than I care about me. So conferences like this, conversations like this, supportive people in the community like this, lets us know how important it is our health is. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, the mayor's 10-point literacy plan talks about what the schools can do, mm -hmm. um, what parents can do, and what our community partners and nonprofits can do to address literacy. So how and where do you see your organization's role and commitment to an early literacy initiative? So I don't think folks recognize how important it is, those early visits, when, you're bringing your, when, you, um, when your child leaves the hospital, they have a hearing test that you follow up if there's findings, that you um, follow up on their eye exams. It's really difficult if a child can't hear or doesn't have good sight in order to be, you know, to be literate. Recognizing that you should know your child's health information. All of us yep. have what they call patient portals, mm -hmm. right? Like we, ours is called MyChart, mm -hmm. and that's where Same. all of your health information and all of your child's health information is at your fingertips. People who know their health information are, are healthier than people who don't. But I can't tell you how infrequently, this is your medical record. It doesn't belong to the hospital, right. it belongs to you, and right. you should know what's in it. And if you don't know, don't understand, then let's ask questions. When you come to a visit, bring your blood pressure cuff. I know households that have red bottom shoes, but no blood pressure cuff. We know that hypertension is killing us as a community. We need a blood pressure cuff. We need to make sure that we understand. I'm sorry, a little passionate about this. <laughs> but there's things that we can do so that we can have better outcomes. And I, I would say that making sure you don't skip those screenings, that you don't blow off visits. When, you know, the one month, you know how you have the book and it says I need to see it one month, three months. Those are important visits for you to get important information about your child's ability to read and to learn. And, and don't, one, thing, one of the things we do in our community is that we, we really bristle against anyone saying that our child is different or maybe learning differently. There are brilliant, brilliant people with ADHD. Sure. We don't want to get them tested because they're going to, no, get them the support they need so that they can shine. My son has um, ADHDI, inattentive, and I remember walking into a classroom and the classroom had, had just so many distractions. He couldn't learn in there. Be a, a, an active part of your child's education so that you can get them. We don't all learn the same. Be the champion for that. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, in this age of technology, we're all empowered. We're all empowered to take care of our, of our own health, watch our medical records, all of our information. Just like she said with the patient portal, I think that's something that's very underutilized by a lot of patients, you know, because literally there you can see all of the information that you need, how, what you need to follow up on with your primary care doctor or any physician, or even take that information to maybe the specialist you need to see. So you're able to monitor your own health, your, your child's health. So I think that's something that patients should really embrace. You, you are empowered to take your information, have it, and use it as you will. Thank you, thank you for that. So before we wrap up, any last comments or statements that you wanna give? I just wanna say that you know we're, there are different health organizations in the city, and us collaborating together and working together will impact the health of our city. I believe that Newark can be one of the healthiest cities and not at the bottom of the, at bottom of the list. And it's gonna take all of us sort of being, um, embracing what we know we can do to make it happen. And it's, it's gonna happen. Collaboration is key. In Newark, there's a lot of great minds, a lot of things going on. You know, I've had the pleasure of working with Brooke Tithens before as well. Um, just, you know, there is a great things that us hospitals, us healthcare centers, and organizations can do together, you know. And, you know, I think the mayor is very supportive of that. The council, men and women are very supportive of that. And I look forward to what 2024 can uh, hold for all of us. And I just want to thank my CEO, Ed Jimenez, for thinking this was important enough for us to show up and to be a part of the conversation. We're here. 
Thank you, thank you so much. It's gonna be so important going forward if we're gonna move this forward yep. and really improve the health and wellness of our city for us to partner together and work together. Hospitals, community centers, the health mm -hmm. departments here in the, in the city and, and the surrounding urban areas. So I thank mm -hmm. you for taking the time to thank be part you. of this discussion. We appreciate you and we look forward to more partnership and collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So let me just make sure the technology is working. All right, good. All right. And I'm glad I got you before lunch or during lunch and not after lunch. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, um, my name is Domali Campbell Oparaji. I am an obstetrician, gynecologist, um, and I do want to thank um, Dr. Sharni Brown and her team and everybody who was involved um, in organizing this important conversation. Um, the room looks amazing, and I know there's a lot of hard work that has gone into making this event um, happen today. So. Uh, if we just take a moment to give a round of applause to everybody who was involved, because nothing of this magnitude happens by itself. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, as I said, or as was said, I am a physician, I'm a medical doctor. Um, I wear a lot of hats and I do a lot of things. Um, but today I wanna to talk about um, and acknowledge some of the things that separate us and distinguish us, but how we can talk about moving forward and talk about things that can bring us together. Um, so you found out who I am, I'm wearing a lot of hats, and all that means um, is that I'm doing way too much. <laughs> and, but in that, you know, people say, you know, how are you doing all this stuff? Um, but I think the important point that I want to bring out is that I really, at the heart, I believe that I am just like every person in this room, and I believe that every person in this room is just like me. And so I believe that we all deserve the best out of healthcare. We all deserve quality healthcare and it really shouldn't matter um, the color of your skin, what zip code you live in, those things. Um, healthcare really is a human right. I do not have any financial disclosures I do disclose that I have the lived experience of a New Jersey birthing person who gave birth to three living children in New Jersey. And one of them was born 16 weeks too soon. And I emphasize that because these issues that we're talking about are very personal to me. And oftentimes, we get bogged down with numbers and percentages, and we forget that there are individual people and families behind these outcomes. I also disclose that my work is often not valued as much by others because of my race and my gender. And I say this to say that we can't have a conversation about health, health care, and health outcomes without acknowledging systemic racism and that women are not generally valued and compensated the same as our male counterparts for their work. And the intersectionality of race and gender bias that black women face is very important, particularly when you look at wage gaps, opportunities, 
missed opportunities, career advancements, and the ability to build generational wealth. So I was asked to talk a little bit about data, and so I think that many people are aware that when we look at our healthcare outcomes in the U.S. Um, compared to other industrialized nations, we do not fare as, as well as we would like. We fare fairly poorly. Um, but I think it's also interesting to note that Red line shows the high U.S. maternal mortality rate. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that if we only looked at the maternal mortality rate for white people, for white women in the U.S., that number would still be way higher than the other industrialized nations. So it would be 26.1. So you can see that it's still out of proportion to other industrialized nations. And I say that not to um, dismiss the racial disparities, because I'm going to get to the racial disparities, but I say that to emphasize the fact that there's a problem and an underlying problem with our healthcare system in general. So this is just unacceptable. Um, this is a disparity that we see between um, mortality rates between non-Hispanic white women, which is that kind of blue teal line, and African American women, which is that red line. And it's not new. It, is persistent and existent. And I think we need to address it, and it's imperative that as we work on solutions for all populations, um, we have to really dig into why these disparities exist. Otherwise, you know, the danger is that we may improve some mortality rates, but we may still see that mortality rates for African American women go unchanged. So we have to not only look at the general rates, but we have to look at the disparities. So there's really an urgency in my mind to ensuring quality maternal care is available for all expectant mothers. We should have an aspirational goal for everyone to be able to see a clinician within two weeks of calling or coming to an office to get care. I know I work at University Hospital. I know a lot of other obstetricians and we talk about workplace workforce shortages. So is that goal possible? Maybe, maybe not. But how will we know unless we try? How will we know unless we track and measure? How can insurance companies ensure that they have enough providers in their networks who offer hours that are amenable to patients that have various work schedules? Are we offering employers incentives to accommodate people to go for prenatal care? Because oftentimes I see patients, sometimes if they miss an appointment, they had to go to work. So we have to start to think outside the box for some of these solutions. And we can't wait for people to get pregnant to start working on their health. She said facts. 
I'll, I'm gonna say it again. We can't wait for people to get pregnant to start working on health. We need excellent medical care for young girls, for children through adolescence and into young adulthood. We need it through the entire spectrum of life. So we have to demand that systems and policymakers and any leaders recognize that reproductive justice is a fundamental human right. As individuals, um, we need to pay attention to what we're putting into our bodies, how we're taking care of our bodies, inside and out. We have to manage, and I say we, because I do consider myself part of the healthcare system, um, how we are managing chronic illness for people, which includes not only medical problems like asthma and diabetes, but also anxiety and depression. Those are chronic illnesses and we can't treat them separately. People don't choose to have bipolar disorder. So people with asthma should have an asthma action plan. Diabetics should be able to afford their medicines. And people with mental health issues should be able to get care in their community without stigma and fear. And we need a diverse workforce. So what does getting quality prenatal care encompass? It really encompasses, it means getting care in the first trimester of the pregnancy. And it means that as a system, hospital, office, how do we ensure earlier access for people with higher risk? people who have had previous pregnancy complications, people with chronic medical conditions. How do we provide respectful and non-judgmental counseling? Sometimes prior to pregnancy, people may use tobacco, people may drink alcohol, or use marijuana. And so when they become pregnant, we need to have respectful and non-judgmental conversations about how those things can affect their unborn child. Respectful and non-judgmental. And quality prenatal care usually consists of monthly visits and they will become more frequent as you get closer to the due date. Pregnancy is a condition, it's not a disease. And much of the prenatal care that we offer is usually prevention based, we're looking to prevent complications or problems from, from occurring. In rare circumstances where people may have a chronic medical problem, we can talk about increased risk of particular problems developing, but pregnancy is not a disease and we shouldn't treat it as such. Our body changes and we have to learn to adjust to the many changes that our body is gonna go through. But I truly and honestly feel that um, when you're getting quality prenatal care, you should feel happy and excited. You should be looking forward to coming to your visit. And I encourage my patients and I encourage all of you to ha ask at least one question at every visit. 
And some of my patients laugh when I say, you can't leave until you ask me a question. They laugh. It's a time where clinicians do a lot of counseling, and usually pregnant people are very open because they want to do the very best for their children. And so they're open um, for education and counseling and learning. And that's what we should be providing, education and counseling on nutrition and exercise and talking. There's a lot to talk about. Preterm labor, home safety, perinatal mood disorders, Every pregnancy is different. And I think it's important that at every visit, the pregnant person and family should feel comfortable to ask questions. Um, and I try to emphasize to pregnant persons that every pregnancy is different. A lot of times people think Sometimes you may hear that people say, well, you were pregnant before, so you should know. But we shouldn't make people feel like, feel that way. Every pregnancy is different. And quality prenatal care should address the concerns and the questions that the pregnant person and family has. Um, I love these graphics. Um, they come from the Black Billing Birth of Rights. And it would be great if many of the places that we sought care had images that were diverse and voiced some of these principles. Like, I am seen and heard. Believe me. and I see me in my provider. I also want to remind us, we spend nine months focusing on pregnancy, focusing on labor and delivery, and then the baby comes. And it's not enough for us to walk out of the hospital and say, whew, I made it out alive. That's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not enough for us to be happy and settle to survive. We should expect to thrive. And I can't stress enough that once the baby is born, far too often we turn our backs on the mother to the baby. And we can't forget about that birthing person. We can't forget about our own health. About 80% of pregnancy associated and 20% of pregnancy related deaths occur in the late postpartum period. So that's 43 days to one year after the pregnancy ends. So just to emphasize how important that postpartum period is. And being a black woman, and I you know, wholeheartedly believe that my mother was trying to prepare me for life. And what she knew was going to be out in the world for me. You know, 
don't ask for help, take everything on, don't say no. But what I realize is this is actually killing us. <laughs> you know, this is weathering us, this is killing us. So we have to lean on others. We have to lean on others, particularly in that postpartum period. And so I want to pivot a little bit to uh, reading to the unborn child. I believe that in the morning, you talked a little bit about the strong foundation for literacy for our children. And we can start by reading as early as possible, even while the baby is still in the womb. Um, reading, can, reading during pregnancy can also help mothers reduce anxiety, worry, and stress. Um, it can improve maternal and baby bonding and it can improve concentration and memory. Between 16 and 22 weeks of pregnancy, um, the baby starts to hear faint signs, sounds inside the body. So they can hear noises made by our breathing, by our heartbeat, and by our digestion. And at 23 weeks, so that's just under six months, um, the baby can hear sounds from the outside world, including our voices. So I think one of the main points of this conference is to talk about the power of early literacy and how we can connect that to prenatal care. And so language and literacy develop together as a baby grows from an infant to a toddler to a school-aged child. And the key to development is human interaction. So babies and toddlers, their brain grows very quickly, and that is critical for their language development. And so when we hand a child our phone or an iPad, they will miss important social interactions that we can provide by reading. And once that opportunity passes, it's hard to make up. Some of those brain cells that would have been nurtured and developed may start to fade away. And so building literacy and language skills helps children be kindergarten ready and so that they will enter school with a love of books and ready to learn. And so this is so important for school success um, because as they move into school, they will learn to read and then they will read to learn. I think reading also is important for self-esteem and building resist resilience in people. And so what I'm suggesting is that we, we, if we're not already doing it, we encourage pregnant women to um, read to their children prenatally. And my suggestion, so at 28 weeks, um, typically we would advise women to lay on their left side to do what we call fetal kick counts. And that's a way of determining fetal well-being. And so as they're laying on their left side to do the fetal kick counts, they can read. Um, and so it's a great time to read out loud to the baby. If they have other children, they can have those children get involved um, by letting them read. Or if the children are smaller and they can also listen to the story or they can read one word at a time. They can identify pictures. So everyone can get involved. Dad can get involved in reading. So we all learn different ways. Some people are visual learners. 
Some people are auditory learners, and some people um, learn by doing things. And so you can even incorporate body movements in when you're telling a story. There is still a ton of development that occurs at the end of the pregnancy, and I particularly like this slide because the fetal brain at 35 weeks, you can see the difference between the fetal brain at 35 weeks and 40 weeks. And 40 weeks is when your due date is. So typically when we get to 35 weeks, we're tired of sharing our body. We're like, I'm tired of this pregnancy. I want this kid out, you know? But there's so much brain development that's still occurring. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so important for pregnancies to go full term. These are just a few community resources just to remind us that postpartum is a very important time for mothers. And they are all available um, online. And I hope I will certainly will make my slides available uh, for anyone who wants to utilize the resources. But to wrap up, because I'm excited to get to our panel discussion, I really want to make a call of action. I feel that there's something, we can all do something. We can all do something before the end of the year. Hospitals, offices, providers, we can look at our institutional policies. We can measure our goals for getting our patients into first trimester care. Community members, when we participate in gender reveal parties and baby showers, we can promote literacy in expectant parents by giving a board book to parents and to siblings. Um, clinicians can offer guidance and ask expectant parents do they have questions that haven't been answered? We need insurance companies to increase reimbursement for doulas and for clinicians for medically complex patients. We need insurance companies to help reduce barriers for patients to get durable medical equipment and ancillary services like visiting home nurses services. What's the role of urgent care centers in care of pregnant and postpartum patients? Because I'm seeing a lot of urgent care centers popping up and pregnant and postpartum patients using these urgent care centers, but I'm not sure who's monitoring the quality of care. And we need to ask our community leaders, our advocates, and our legislators, how are we being how are they being accountable to constituents? And each one of us needs to make sure we're registered to vote and use our power to vote to vote for policymakers who are going to make the change that we want to see. And just yesterday, I got an email about legislation that Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Presley, I think she's from Connecticut, uh, is sponsoring to create baby bonds, the American Opportunity Accounts Act, which would create a savings account at birth for every child of $1,000 with additional deposits depending on family income that would help close the racial wealth gap for women and for black and Hispanic families. But we gotta vote for it. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. I can entertain a few questions um, while our panelists come up. People always ask me, where are the black doctors? 
And I say, you got to send some of your kids to medical school. <laughs> We're the compassionate doctors. Send some of your kids to medical school. We're the bilingual doctors. I need you to send some of your children to medical school. We need a more diverse workforce. And it's already been proven that having that diverse workforce improves health outcomes. So thank you for your time, and I think our panelists are here. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for that amazing talk and really bringing together the importance of quality prenatal care, postpartum support, and early literacy for our little people and families. So now I'd like to welcome our panel to the stage, as I almost fall. You can sit wherever you want. Yes, and Dominique is coming up. And right before that, Nikki is making a quick housekeeping announcement for folks going into sessions. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Wake up from lunch. We have a really exciting panel happening and really excited about this. Uh, just before we get started, I'm just gonna ask the following people to just meet me in the hallway by the registration table. Arima Vining, Dr. Wafia Salim, Tawana Thompson, Betty Arrington, Michelle Gabriel Caldwell, and Dr. Nastasha Harris. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. I already have one. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. We've already met Dr. Campbell, so welcome to our panel. Thank you for being here. We also have Tayana Perez, the Executive Director of Teach for America New Jersey. Tayana, wave your hand. I'm going in order. Luann Foster, Founder and Executive Director of Life After Two Losses. And we have Tonique Griffin, a full spectrum doula working for the partnership. And I've been talking, but I am Jasmine Rivera. I'm the Managing Director for Programs, Monitoring, and Evaluation at Brick Education Network, working on the South Ward Promise neighborhood. And we also have a program called Healthy Beginnings, which really thinks about supporting maternal and child health outcomes. So Dr. Campbell, we're going to kick it off with you. So you gave us an amazing, comprehensive overview of the importance of quality prenatal care, early literacy, and lots of other things that we should be keeping in mind when we're seeking out care and supporting ourselves and mothers. What, recommend, what recommendations do you have for an expecting parent that needs to navigate all of these complicated systems and needs? Okay. Ooh, that's gonna... Okay. Yeah, it's a lot, I think, um, to navigate. But I think that the most important thing um, is to try to start as early as possible is one of my recommendations. And then, again, I would recommend that people ask questions. And I actually recommend that people write their questions down because sometimes when you go to the doctor or when you go to a healthcare provider, you know, you just think you feel rushed. You might be made to feel like, you know, you don't want to take up too much time. And so I think it's important to write down your questions. Um, and I tell my own family members, if someone doesn't want to take the time to answer your questions, they're actually telling you something. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. So now I'm going to go to Tonique. So can you talk to us about the impact that having a doula in your prenatal and postpartum period has on birth and postpartum outcomes? Hello, okay. you can hear me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the prenatal period. Uh, a doula can help give you educational tips, emotional tips, remind you about your stress factor. Um, they discuss 
some of the conversations you might have with your doctor to make sure that they're clear, um, that you understand what's going on. Uh, we talk about exercise at different stages. Different exercises can help prepare your body for that process. We start focusing on um, pain management. Uh, we talk about that. We got to think about that because there will be pain when you have a baby. And how you anticipate on dealing with the pain can help you mentally prepare yourself, whether it's breathing, whether it's meditation. Some people just like to keep moving, you know, not laying in bed. They want to keep moving. Um, it helps if you meet your doula months or weeks before you actually give birth. But I just had this uh, a pleasure of meeting a mom in labor and delivery, and it was a fluid process. Beautiful. We delivered a baby in three hours, so oh. beautiful. <laughs> But um, your doula is your companion for your pregnancy journey. And you can, most relationships, you can almost tell them everything. Sometimes a lot of things come out during labor and delivery. But then also, a doula also is going to get you to think about the postpartum period. Thank you, Tonique. You're and welcome. it really sounds like that supports what Dr. Campbell has also been talking about, making sure that we're aware of our health, making sure that we're asking those questions on our appointments, making sure that we're aware of what's going on, and also supporting that mother, that birthing person, and that baby. I'm seven months postpartum. I'm forever changed, so I know what it's like <laughs> to go through this process and have mm -hmm. that support system for us as well. Now, Luen, I'm going to go to you. So in your work, you provide health education and information to expecting parents. From your perspective, what topics should pregnant folks be aware of to prepare them for their journey to delivery and through postpartum? Yes, so before I answer your question, I just want to give a little background information on my background so you can better understand my work. So I suffered two preventable pregnancy losses, largely due to systemic um, racism and implicit bias. And after having my healthy baby boy, I almost died from severe, severe postpartum preeclampsia because I showed up to many hospitals, many medical providers, and I kept being dismissed by biased healthcare workers, and it literally almost cost me my life. And from that work, I founded my organization, Life After Two Losses, and with this organization, aside from providing grief support to all those impacted by miscarriage, uh, pregnancy, and infant loss, we have a new pilot program, which we're doing health literacy, program and the reason for that is most of our clients reported um, having discrimination in the healthcare fields and we want to be able to provide them with the tips and tools so they can better advocate for themselves in this climate. A uh, recent report stated that it could take years or even a decade for the system to change and as I've learned through my experience that black women and black babies do not have years. So we need to equip and empower our women and families so they can better advocate for themselves. Thank you so much, Buen. Thank you for sharing that with us, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Thank and that's why this work is so important, so we can make sure that folks are able to birth safely and birth and have healthy babies. But then also, like Dr. Hibble saying, birth with joy. It's not enough to survive, but for our babies to survive, we need to thrive, and that requires all of us and a whole entire system. So even though we know that things are stark and sometimes scary for birthing people that aren't listened to, that aren't taken well care of, we have a lot of attention sometimes on the birth period, right, the pregnancy period, and then after a baby comes home, sometimes we're like, what do we do with this thing? There's not as much support. How do we raise a child, a healthy, emotionally well, smart child, right? How do we do that? So that's where this early literacy idea comes in to set our children up for success through their life course. So Taina, I'm gonna to go to you now. Can you talk to us about what practical tools and strategies you have for mothers or caregivers or people around little people that can support learning and literacy for our youngest learners? Absolutely. Um, I think the theme that I'm picking up on as I'm sitting in this panel is that uh, we get to be in charge of the story that gets told. And I think that the same goes for literacy. We get to be in charge of what literacy looks like for our families and our children. And I just, uh, I think I'll probably reiterate a lot of what Dr. Campbell has shared, what Dr. Edwards shared this morning, but I do think it's worth repeating, um, is that we get to be in that driver's seat. And so one of the uh, websites that I often go to as a mother myself um, is I have four very different learners. Uh, my first 
picked up a book and was reading to me before I even got a chance to say, hey, this is the letter. And then my second was reluctant. And then the third was even more reluctant. Um, and so all the things that I was doing with my first were not working. And so I found this website called um, improvingliteracy.org. Um, it, it's one if you have a chance to go through. What I took from that one in particular was it helped me start to figure out how do I even have discussions and conversations around literacy instruction and intervention. Um, also, it taught me a lot about uh, evidence-based reading. A lot of the times the way that I was taught to read or maybe some of us in here were taught to read are actually not the best practices. I know that if you didn't learn it by heart or it didn't just come to you right away, you were maybe labeled as a poor reader, a slow reader, and those things are not true. There's actually uh, data and research that shows how we learn to read, and I'll go through that in a little bit. But the third thing, um, that really helped me also is that it gives you tips on how to address concerns that you're seeing um, in your child in terms of literacy development and giving me the language that I needed. And um, I've worked with children. I was a teacher. And yet, when it came to my own child, I found myself kind of struggling and drowning. So it gave me the language um, that I probably needed to empower my parents with when I was teaching their children, but I found um, later. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important um, is that it can look different ways. So this is a little bit controversial, but um, I know that iPads and Leap Pads and all of those things and YouTube and you know Coco Melon. I know that it's like the thing that we're saying our children shouldn't have. But I also want to be realistic, right? I know that when I'm, I gotta cook dinner, I gotta clean a thing, I gotta you know put uh, this child to bed. This kid is sick. I'm going to put something on. Um, and I, I want to name that we shouldn't feel demonized by that, right? But there is something that we can do to actually make it worthwhile. And so um, if your child is going to watch something or click through something, one, uh, most books you can find on YouTube. You can play it. And they will read um, you know, The Very Hungry Caterpillar or uh, Pajama Llama. Any book you need, they, will, they probably have it. And someone can read that story to you. But what's also really important is that we have to just talk to our kids. So a lot about reading is not just learning the sounds, but also understanding what you're reading. And so if my child is watching Coco Melon, even though it pains me, at the end I'm going to say, Benny, what was JJ's problem just then? Why was JJ upset? And you know, at first he'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like he's just like, I just want to sing the song. But it's really helping you to know, understand. Like you can talk about what they're seeing, right? Or if there's Blues Clues or Nickelodeon or Paw Patrol, getting them to talk about the characters or about their personalities, their traits, what the problem was, how did they resolve it, what was the character's feelings. And so, you know, raising children in 2023 we have to figure out how we use technology to our benefit because it's it's here, right? So it's about you know, sit and watch it with them if you can. Ask them the questions. Have them recall the story. Um, if you're going to, you know, watch a movie, same thing. Talk about it. Visit the library. I know, you know, there are also a lot of programs on Saturdays. People will read to your child. And, um, you know, those are always good because we're getting that exposure. But I'd also say that um, what I also know as a teacher is that we can read and read and reach our children, but that's not going to be enough. Um, and so I'd also, you know, one of the, another strategy that I would encourage us all to look into is how are we helping our children access the alphabetic code, right? Like, I know we focus a lot on the ABC song, and that's really important. Like, it's really good for, for talking and child development, but it's just that. It's a song. And so we have to help our children associate the letter to the sound. You know, it's like, yes, we can sing A, B, C, D, but if I just uh, take a letter out of order and say J, what does that say? What's the sound? Let's say it together. That's really going to be key for the children as well. Um, you know, I... The, the Dollar Tree is my friend, the magnets. I'm always looking to see what they have, what we can build. I'm finding twine. Um, shaving cream, believe it or not, um, is a great tool to clean. Shockingly, you put on the table, you put shaving cream, you let the children trace a letter, say the sound. So it's not about needing to go and buy all of these gadgets and things and, you know, it lights up, it speaks. That There's a place and time for that, but you can also use the things that you have at home. Um, and then I would say that the last thing that I would focus on um, 
is that it can be really intimidating to help unlock literacy for your child. Um, and what we've learned actually is that reading, we're not hardwired to read. The brain actually is not hard, hardwired for this. So we're actually helping our children lay different synapses in their brain to be able to uncover this really complex code. And so when children struggle, that's okay. It doesn't mean that they're not enough or they don't know or if we're struggling to help them or we might still be struggling on our own, it's a complex thing and we need to just stick with it and have that patience. Thank you so much, Taina. And it is overwhelming when you, to have your own children try to understand how to do some of these things. We're not trained teachers, and even you humanizing it, when you are a trained teacher, it can still be difficult. So it's critical that we have tools, resources, support to help us navigate all of these systems, all of these content areas for ourselves and our babies and our little people. So thank you. So now I'm gonna offer a final takeaway question for each of our panelists to answer. So for each of you, what is the most important piece of advice you would give to expecting and new parents? Anyone can start. So I would say to designate um, a family member or someone close to you. So in the event you're not able to advocate for yourself, that you have someone there that knows your wishes. I will also add to that that you know your body and nobody knows your body as well as you do so if you feel that something is not right with you or your baby speak up and even if you're not being heard or your views are not being addressed keep showing up until you demand that someone hears you because as in my situation it could potentially save your life like my son wouldn't have a mom had i not continued to advocate for myself and if you struggle to do that, please um, find us online, Life After Two Losses, and we will help you learn to be a better advocate for yourself. Thank you. Um, I guess just in the same vein, I would just continue to say, like, be patient with yourself. Be patient with your kids. Um, Literacy is not something that's like a spontaneous thing that happens one day to the next. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes discipline. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we probably all grew up here was like practice makes perfect. And I'm like, that's a bad word in my house. We don't say perfect, we say practice makes progress. Um, because every milestone, every, you know, if you knew something today that you didn't know yesterday, that's a win. Um, and then I would, I would also say, you know, definitely check out that website because I think the, the, the place to start this is with our caregivers in our pre-K center with teachers, asking them, like, they have to sit with you and answer the hard questions. Show me what it means to be a proficient reader in kindergarten, in first grade. Show me what this test in third grade means. What does that look like? I'd also, you know, even ask um, our schools, like, do you all have anything like a, re you know, reading screening that happens for our earliest readers when they come in? Um, any kind of interventionist? Um, also, you know, if you have a school-age child who's struggling, ask about tutoring. That is a right that we have. Um, but, but be patient, be persistent. And even if you fall one day or it's hard, it, it's, it's not over. Just showing up every day is half the battle. So give your child that grace, but give yourself that grace too, um, because that's going to keep you going um, in perpetuity. Hi, I'm so sorry. So I just wanted to piggyback off a couple of things that were said today. Um, Dr. Campbell talked about um, reading um, during the prenatal period, which was something that I did in all three of my pregnancies. And my son, at 22 months, he knew how to spell his name. And I cannot put him to bed without a minimum of five books, <laughs> which, you know, it, it sounds like a little bit, but it definitely can be a lot. And I say that. Again, you mentioned the not only being able to say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but again, being able to point to the letters out of order and him being able to tell me the letters. And um, again, I really just attest that to the reading. Like, and it's just reading, like just getting a book and reading to them. And it's really, again, has built the foundation for literacy for him. So I just wanted to add that point, especially as a mom who has followed a lot of the things that you ladies talked about. Um, so I would say a couple of things, but um, one is I think we all have an instinct or an intuition, um, and I think we say it in a different way, 
trust your body, um, and trust yourself. And I think it's important to ask questions. Um, I also think it's important um, if you are involved with a doula or you have a birth plan, um, I think it's important to bring that to the attention of your provider um, and bring that as early as possible um, so that you can be on the same page. Um, don't pull it out in labor and delivery and be like, <laughs> you know, this is what I want. Um, so I think just communication, I think, is so important. Um, and it's a two-way street, and it's, I guess I make it a little hard for people not to communicate with me, but um, I think it's important, as was said, to keep going back to it. So even if you feel like um, maybe you're not being listened to, don't give up. Um, I think you find another person, you find another avenue. Um, certainly in the hospital, um, we have patient advocates that people should be reaching out to if um, there's something that you're not happy with. Um, we can't change things unless we talk about them, talk about our experiences, um, and talk about how we want to make them better for other people. I just want to share a couple of things. Like, I can definitely piggyback off of Dr. Campbell regarding the birth plan, regarding letting your provider know that you have a doula on your team. Like, all of my clients, I usually tell them, let your doctor know we got a doula. If they want to meet me, I'm willing to go. Um, so that's a very important thing. I always encourage reading to your unborn child. Um, that's something that I've been doing from early on. I've been reading to my, my children. I have from 36 to 22 years old. Um, I've read to all of them. Even when I was pregnant, that's one thing I just did. Um, and definitely, I think literacy early, as early as possible. And with when I saw her little, little man over the weekend, he is so handsome. But to, to encourage literacy at an early age, they, they, they will talk earlier. And talk plain language to babies. Don't talk that baby talk. I, I can't stand it. Don't talk baby talk. Talk plain to them, because that's how they learn. And they have them to watch your mouth when you're talking. You know? So a lot, all of this, what we said, and more, um, I encourage you to build out your team. And if you do not like your provider, you have the right to change your provider. There's no one that needs to be at a provider that they feel like they're not comfortable, it's not comfortable, they don't get questions answered, the doctor seems like he don't have enough time to actually tend to you, him or her, don't have enough time to tend to you, or uh, even negate the fact that you want a doula or want to have a doula. If a provider tell you you don't need a doula, I think you should look for somewhere else, look for another provider. So you have a right. You don't have to be stuck with the doctor that you end up with. Um, timing is everything, yeah, but you don't have to be stuck with a provider that you don't feel like they care and have concern for you and your baby. Thank you all so much. Can we all give up a hand for our panel, our illustrative panel? And I hope everyone is able to walk away with at least one practical tool or strategy or thing you're going to implement in your home with your baby. And Tonika has a client in the audience. Wave your hand, client, if you're okay with that. Not being, I'm trying to be HIPAA compliant here, if you're okay with that. So now we're going to take a brief pause. I know the food is still out. If people want to grab some more food, a drink, as we transition into our workshops once we can identify the specific locations. <laughs>